Thanks, everybody, for being here. It's a real delight to, to be in this room this evening. Uh, my name's Tarek Jazil, and I'm a co-director of UCL's Sarah Parker Riemann Centre, which is the Centre for the Study of Racism and Racialization. And we at the Centre are delighted to be one of three hosts, actually, of this event this evening. So we're co-hosting tonight's conversation along with colleagues here at UCL's Centre for the Study of uh, the Legacies of British Slavery, and also our friends at the Next Economy Trust. And in a moment, I'm going to pass over to Leslie Hitchcock-Stone from the Next Economy Trust and then to Jess Hanna from the Centre for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery, both of whom are going to say a few words about their own organisations and their own interests um, in this project. Um, but let me say on behalf of the Sarah Parker Riemann Centre how pleased I am that we're collaborating um, with, with both um, the Next Economy Trust and uh, the CSLBS this evening to bring you this event and to make this conversation happen. And thank you all again for, for being here, for coming this evening. So it's my job and it's my pleasure actually to say a few words just to introduce the event this evening and our speakers as well. So as you all know, because you're here, the title of the event tonight is Black, Fla Black, Black Family History, Genealogy, Storytelling and Ethics in the Wake of Slavery. And we're delighted to welcome our speakers, Kami Nzerim and Bernice Bennett. It's always good to get a round of applause when you haven't done anything yet. <laughs> um, and also... Uh, who, who will both be in conversation this evening with Dr. James Dawkins here as well. And I'll introduce them properly in just a moment. And they're, they're, of course, going to be talking about the very personal project that KME has been working on for a number of years. And, and that, of course, surrounds KME's own attempt to trace his family history. It's a project which has involved many journeys across the Atlantic and into also the deeply traumatic histories of the Atlantic slave trade and the Middle Passage. And it's a project that Kami has embarked upon with cameraman and producer Piers Lee, who's also here this evening. I think, uh, where is he? Piers is around somewhere um, filming. Um, and it's a project at the heart of which has been an attempt to tell this deeply troubling but essential story in documentary film form. And Kami met Bernice in the process of this work, and Bernice has been instrumental in this project in her capacity as one of North America's most renowned black genealogists and family historians. So we're here, obviously, to hear about this quite remarkable project, actually. And as I said, I'm delighted that our three centres have been able to collaborate to bring this uh, event to fruition today. I'm going to take a minute, uh, in a moment, just to, to introduce our speakers before handing over to to Leslie from the Next Economy Trust. So to our speakers uh, this evening, first our host for the evening, Dr. James Dawkins, uh, who's a specialist in British transatlantic slavery. He's an associate research fellow at the University of Nottingham, where he's preparing to publish his own study of the, that institution's historic connections to and enrichment from the transatlantic economy in, in enslaved African people. James is a former member of the Legacies of British Slave Ownership Project here at uh, UCL, which then became the centre for the study of the legacies of British slavery. And he also sits on a number of expert advisory panels for community and scholarly projects, such as the Colonial Countryside, National Trust Houses Reinterpreted, and Colonialism, Slavery, Trade Reparations, re, uh, Remedying the Past. And James has graciously agreed to pose the questions this evening, but he also has his own story uh, to tell about tracing black family histories, which may come up in the course of the conversation. Kami is a journalist by trade, a news anchor and correspondent. But as I've said, he's in the process of making this documentary, which starts really from his own discovery that his white ancestors were enslavers. The film project documents his long and complex search for the descendants of the people that his family had enslaved. But during filming, Kami learned that his Nigerian forebears on his dad's side were also connected to the abduction of people who would be sold as slaves. And Kami's journalistic instincts and skill have been key, I think, to this project, as has his intuition for storytelling, which I think is also a key part of what he's going to be 
talking about what we will be talking about this evening, that is to say, the ethics of storytelling and the craft of storytelling, actually. And finally, uh, Bernice Bennett, who, as I've said, is one of America's most renowned black genealogists and family historians. Bernice made her name helping African-Americans trace their stolen family histories, and she subsequently received a number of awards for her genealogical writing and research. Bernice also hosts a radio show exploring and celebrating black genealogy, and she's a former member of the board of directors for the National Genealogical Society. She's the author of Black Homesteaders of the South, published in 2000, uh, uh, 2022, uh, also of Tracing Their Steps, a memoir, 2019, and Our Ancestors, Our Stories, from 2014. And her paternal family actually is from the same small town in South Carolina as Kami's mother. Uh, and they met, as I said, in the process of conducting this project. Really pleased to welcome all three of you here. But what I'm going to do now is just hand over to Leslie, who's the uh, co-founding executive director of the Next Economy Trust, just to say a few words about their involvement in this project. So, Leslie, over to you. So I'm Leslie, and I'm the co-founding executive direction, director of Next Economy Trust, which is a media and production company. Um, we focus on um, projects that are rooted in data, diversity, inclusivity, and that um, are committed to social justice. And so early on in our time as, um, as an organization, we were introduced to KAMI. And um, um, since then, we've worked with KAMI and also the Sarah Parker Riemann Center and also the Center for the Legacies of British Slavery and had hoped to one day see them all in a, a room together with us. And that happened on its own accord. And that's what's so powerful about the work that each center um, and KAMI are doing because these ripples that we're all doing, throwing a rock in a pond to change um, life as we all know it needs to be it happens without any type of pushing if you are just around and do it. And so that's what I wanted to say was to say thank you to Kami for trusting Next Economy Trust, me and my um, co-founder Saul Klein to partner with you on this journey. I know that that's not, we don't take that lightly. Um, we could want to be involved in a project and a project could not want us around, but we um, have really enjoyed um, getting to know you and supporting you on this journey and um, being here tonight. So um, I also have um, an acute interest in the topic. I am an American immigrant here. I've been here for eight years and I am originally from North Carolina and my family has been in the States for as long as white people have been on the continent and so have been part of um, the checkered history of the United States. And so for me to be able to see that um, this story is able to be told because of um, you know, family history that, was, that is able to be traced is really, really special and meaningful because I know so many African Americans, black Americans don't have that um, option. So for me, it is also very personal to be involved in this because the um, families in North Carolina who bear my descendants' last names don't have this opportunity. So any way that we can be part of this, we are. So thank you for having us. And now I'm going to hand it over to Jess Hanna. Where is Jess? There's Jess from the Center for the Legacies of British Slavery. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, Professor Matthew J. Smith, director of the Center for the Study of the Legacy of British Slavery, um, sends his apologies for not being able to be with us for this important event. Um, so on his behalf, I'd like to offer a few brief words of welcome. Um, our center has for the past decade been much involved in international conversations about the impact of enslavement on the history of modern Britain um, and the Caribbean societies that have been devastated by its legacies. Through rigorous research, collaboration, uh, creative projects and public engagement activities, we confront these difficult histories and their place in the making of our world. A major part of the work we do is understanding the human stories that lay in the records, the stories of people on both sides of the Atlantic and their experiences in the history of British slavery. Our core research project, Valuable Lives, Black Unfreedom and the Collapse of British Slavery in Jamaica, 
will create a database of records of all the enslaved persons in Jamaica for the period 1817 to 1832. This work complements the earlier project that focused on the 20 million pound compensation payment to British enslavers at emancipation. For those of you who wish to learn more about our work and projects, um, I invite you to visit our website or to contact us directly at cslbs at ucl.ac.uk. Um, you should also feel free to um, speak with me or my colleagues um, in the room after this event um, for further information about our centre. A crucial part of our new work is understanding black family histories during and after slavery. This is important, we believe, because the rupture of family networks was one of the most devastating aspects of slavery. It is, it's also important because in these histories lay the understanding of the connections that have shaped the world of their descendants from Jamaica um, to the UK. We're therefore delighted to be partnering with the Sarah Parker Riemann Center and the Next Economy Trust, to, um, two of our most important partners at the center, um, in presenting this evening's conversation with Kami, Bernice, and James, uh, which in so many ways reflect the very concerns that drive our work. Um, what do these personal family histories that Kami has uncovered say about much larger and complicated processes of capital, of human ownership, colonialism, and their echoes today? And what are our responsibilities in telling these stories respectfully? On behalf of our center, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Kami and Bernice, um, whose deep interest in the politics, ethics, and possibilities of unearthing and sharing histories of enslavement has much in common with our own. Their conversation promises to be rich, to be a rich and nuanced exploration of black genealogy, storytelling, and the practice of bringing contemporary and historical family histories to life. I look forward to what will be a tremendously important discussion. Um, thank you, and I'll now hand over to James and our panel. We will just dive into this. Kami, Bernice, welcome. Thank you. And good Thank evening. You. Thank you. Um, Kami, fantastic, amazing story. Um, I learned a bit about this uh, last week in conversation with you and Bernice. And what we all want to know, mm. can you take us back to the start of this? Mm. How it's, how did this, how did this all happen? Where did this start? How did you meet Bernice? Can you can you tell us a bit about that and take us on this journey, please? Sure. So it would probably be useful to lay out some of the, the context um, because I've realized in telling this story or starting to tell this story over the last five years as, as we've gone through the research um, that who I am really matters. It, it matters because when I had the big discovery, which I'll go into in more detail, I, I knew it was something that I couldn't unsee. And lots of people have said to me, why does it matter so much? Why did it matter so much to you? The discovery was a will that my uncle, who's flown in, um, yep, <coughs> Uncle Frank, um, it was a discovery that my uncle had made. As we get older, family history starts to get more important. I became a father. My daughters are here. Um, and I began to get more interested in who I was and what my past was. My uncle sent round an email to most of the family to say, look, I've, I've um, found this, I found that, and here's a will, an old will, an 1829 will. And, and the contents of that will just tore me, tore me apart and, and, and flipped my identity upside down. And, and I'll, I'll just go into that mm -hmm. in detail in a moment. But let, let's do this context bit. My, my mum's American. Hey, mum. My dad's Nigerian. Hello, dad. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm mixed heritage, and I'm very proud of that. I'm very connected to both my black and white histories. And I've already, always known my histories, and I've never... There's never been a gap. I've always known that if I wanted to know my history, I could, I could find that out because there was no hiatus, there was no interruption. My people were, my people were never enslaved. 
my experience as a young, mixed heritage, racialized as black man, growing up in the 70s and 80s in the UK, was, was instrumental to my discovery. One of my earliest memories of coming to the UK, I wasn't born in the UK, I was born in Zambia. One of my earliest memories of coming to the UK, I was five years old, we were living in Northern Ireland. I remember being chased through my own back garden by kids hurling insults at me. And I had no idea what they were saying, but I knew that it was mean. And I later realized that they were being racist. Throughout my youth, that experience would come back again and again. And, and I'm sure there are many people of color, black people, mixed heritage people in this room, that we bury these experiences of racism. Now, the flip side, I was very lucky. I always had great friends. I had white friends. I was connected to my white family. So I, I'm lucky to have been able to navigate uh, my, my black experience as a mixed person as well. I mean, everyone should be proud of their heritage. But my particular singular experience of being a young black man was regularly having to deal with the risk, the threat of not just verbal but physical violence. I grew up in southeast London in the 80s. That meant possibly not coming home at night if I would ended up in the wrong part of town. So I, I knew very viscerally, I felt very viscerally the impact of racism and the core, the, the genesis of that racism was the creation of, of slavery, the creation of black people as inferior. So I had, this, I had this conception of myself and my family, my identity, as being, uh, righteous is the wrong word, but on the receiving end of this egregious, heinous act, which was slavery. Yet I'd never ever dug into, never had to, never needed to really interrogate what that meant. What that meant being an African, what that meant being uh, the descendant of white American Southerners. I was me, I was a black man who grew up in the UK and had experienced racism. Back to the will that my uncle found. Purely interested in family history, who are we, where did we come from? There were words of such violence in that will that I, I could never unsee them. My fourth great grandfather, John Reinhardt of Edgefield County, South Carolina, bequeathed to his wife, and I will paraphrase from memory, I bequeathed to my wife two Negroes, Cato and Jack, and horses, and bales of hay, and other chattels. It so devastated me that I, that I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to process this realization that in me and in my blood was the coming together of this original sin. And I knew I had to find some way of dealing with that for myself. And that was the beginning of the journey for me. Well, I mean, um, it's, I, I've come across some of these worlds in my own research and it's horrifying, it's shocking seeing your ancestors listed as chattel and sometimes with, they, they could have prices next to them. I mean, um, I, I, just so I'm, uh, I, I mean, from, from this then, how do you begin working with Miss Bernice Bennett? Well, I think, I think we should pick the story up from when... <laughs> Bernice, from, yeah. please tell us, how did you connect with Kemi, Kemi and what's, your, what's been your role in um, Kemi's uh, research? Okay, so let me give you a little background. I am from New Orleans. My southern roots run deep, folks. <laughs> my, that's my maternal side. And my paternal side is from South Carolina. Edgefield, South Carolina. 
the same place where Kami's ancestors are from. And this is a large slave-owning community. So how did we connect? Well, Kami was referred to me by someone from the Smithsonian because I have a book out called Our Ancestors, Our Stories, where I documented finding my ancestors enslaved in an inventory similar to what Kami mentioned he saw his ancestors having. But I also documented that I connected with the descendant of the slave owner of my family. And that included going through a process. So Kami reached out to me out of a clear blue sky, I got this email stating who he was and that he had this document. And could I assist him? Now, I've been involved in genealogical research for a long time. And I said, well, sure. I mean, can you imagine somebody writing you and asking you if you could find descendants that are listed on the inventory? And I said, yes, I, I, could, I could help you. So to, so to, <laughs> so to, so to interject briefly, um, I, I, had, I had come to a realization quite quickly that what I, what I would need to do is find out what happened to the people that I had seen on that right. will. And by extension, that would inevitably mean trying to find a way to meaningfully connect mm -hmm. with their living descendants. But this was not yet formulated fully in right. my mind. This was the beginning of the request to Benice to right. essentially, I'm lost. What yeah. do I do with this knowledge? And he wanted to find a descendants of Cato and Tech at that time. But he wanted me to find these descendants of these two people. Can you imagine putting your head around finding descendants of these people? And the document was around, it was in the 1830s. 18, 1829, well. Eight, yes, yes. So that was a very long time ago. And so I said, okay, but you know, there's a process that we're, we're going to have to go through, uh, a, a long process. And hopefully we will connect with the descendants, but these, there are things you need to do. And one of them was to visit the ancestral home. He had to come to America. And in Edgefield, South Carolina, this is one of the communities where the records did not burn. So there's a large archives with all original records, which would give Kami an opportunity to really study his family's history and to really get a feel for what that community was like. Want to say more, or you want to keep on? So I, so I, I mean, I think maybe James, if you've got, <laughs> yeah. I, I, no. so, we're, we're setting you yeah. up. <laughs> we're, we're, because what I have learned is that this stuff is incredibly complex, mm -hmm. and while while I was trying to figure out what it was that I needed, Bernice explained, in the first instance, if you want to find black people, because our histories have been stolen because the records do not exist of where we lived and what our names were, the, the brutal irony is you have to search for the records of the white family. And in this space, I was that proxy white family because I am, even with my mixed black skin, I am the descendant of a white slave earning Southern family. So that was the process that you started me on. Right. And one of the things that you have to understand is that, yes, you'll have names, first names, maybe age, but you're not going to have anything else. Only those names are there, and they may be bequeathed to someone else. You may have a several people where they're sold. And so we had these documents where there were other people listed. And so how do you get this whole process started? Yeah. 
<laughs> well, I, I mean, I believe that we have uh, a clip. Yeah. Um, you know, let's. It would be good to kind of like put this into context. Sure. With with your with the, with the first clip, can uh, shall I? Shall I? Do you mind if I just kind of lay some sure, words out for a second? So, this start. This process started five years ago. I, for my own reasons, as a black person, felt that I needed to find a way to meaningfully connect with the descendants of the people that my family had enslaved. I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know how to do that safely because essentially what we're talking about here, and I, and I um, kind of paraphrase in a very awkward and glib way, but essentially what we're talking about here is me knocking on somebody's door and saying, my people enslaved your people. Want to hang out? <laughs> like, it doesn't roll like that. There is so much inherited trauma in this process that I needed to find a way to, to, I needed to come with something, even though I had my own needs to process this really, really difficult history. So fast forward several years with the help of Bernice, we found descendants who wanted to go on this journey of finding out more about all of our histories because what we eventually ended up doing was finding stolen information that was absolutely crucial to those families. But the clip, the clip we're about to see, it's very short. I don't want this to feel like this is kumbaya, happy clappy reunion, let's all come together and hug. The reality is I was incredibly lucky, hugely lucky because of the tutelage and super, super careful guidance that Bernice was able to give me about this process of intentional connection, care, putting the duty of care of the people that I needed to meet for myself at the core of this process. That was the only way I would ever create the space for a meaningful connection to happen. And I was incredibly lucky. And I honestly don't think it usually happens like this. But um, uh, Rick, if we could play the, play the first clip, I'd be really, really grateful. It's been three years now of tough research and I'm finally going to meet descendants. But what do I have for them? Some genealogy? Is that really enough? But it's all I've got and I'm scared, man. I'm really scared that after what my ancestors did, I'm just going to rub salt in their wounds. She didn't even do that with me. That's what I'm right. saying. I don't know if I should be impressed or, or offended. This is it's pretty overwhelming. We shed a few tears just on the way down here, just talking about it. Yeah. yeah. I want to have the conversation and mm -hmm. be honest. Mm -hmm. Only when we've established the truth can we undo 400 years of white supremacy. This is unbelievable. I just wish my mom could be here. I know, I know. We're all gonna go through this together. So you could, that was Benice with a different hairdo. Um, and the other, the other people in that um, clip were Jamila Smith, her mother, Donna, and her daughter, Navaya. Well, I, I was going to ask you, that embrace that you had with the, the young girl, it looks like, I, I, it looks like you, you knew her, that you know her from somewhere. How, like, can you tell us just a little bit about you know, um, your, your feelings there? And this, this young girl running to you, yeah. you know, it's particularly given yeah. this troubling history that we have of your ancestors yep. selling their ancestors into slavery. Yeah, um, and, I, and I'd really love Bernice's, because Bernice was there with me, I'd love her uh, reflection on this as well. I, I was really, really terrified at that point when we were waiting for Jamila and her family to arrive. Um, we had been through quite a long process of getting to know each other 
online. When I, when I started researching this, um, one of the first things that Bernice taught me was that the one thing I could do to help me process this myself was to share the information that I had learned. Because in sharing that information, it might help other families. And I soon learned that that would be what I needed to process and to heal, or to start that process of healing. That if I could play a small role in helping other black families find their histories, then that was what I needed to do to confront what our ancestors had done. Now, in a conventional kind of TV or film production process, all of that information sharing would be withheld from me, withheld from the people that are going on that journey, because you need to retain some kind of revelation on camera. But that felt wrong to all of us involved in this, that, that actually that's the conventional way. And that, what are you doing? You're recreating, you're using tra trauma um, for entertainment. And, and we had to find a different way to do that. So actually what we did was shared everything that we learned as we went along by email, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, the reality of a lot of the documents and the information that you <laughs> learn about in this process is that they're very confusing. They're incredibly hard to read. Ancient wills and censuses and the rest of it, not only are they complicated, but they're also tra traumatic and re-traumatizing to read this litany of dollar values on human beings, it, it rots your soul to read that stuff. But it was incumbent on me to share what I had with Jim Miller and other families as, we've, as we learned it. They, they'd come to us to say, yes, we want to go on this journey. I was sharing it. They turned around and said to me, thank you for sharing it. This is too complicated. You need to get on a plane and share it with us in person so we can look you in the eye and we can understand it and we can go through that process together. So what you see there right. is the outcome of me, with Benice's advice, doing the right thing, sharing the information, and in, instead of the revelation being lost, actually it was gained because there was a, and, I, and again I hesitate because I, I don't want to speak for Jamila, but, um, we created the space for a voluntary coming together and waiting in that car park for Bernice to, uh, Jamila to turn up. I had absolutely no idea what was going to happen. I was shaking. And they got out of the car and Jamila's daughter ran into my arms. I mean, I couldn't believe it. My kids were too old to give me hugs by that stage. <laughs> it's, it's, sorry, Bernice, please. Okay, so let's let's go back. Back up a bit, yeah. Let's go back because one of the things that I strongly encouraged Kami to do was to go public. And going public meant that we had several different ways to do that. I had a radio talk show and I said, okay, we're here, we're in Edgeville, let me interview you for the talk show knowing very well that I had a large black genealogy audience, individuals that would give feedback to him. Oh, yes. They, <laughs> they would say, I think you're doing the right thing, or go home and don't come back. And so Kami and his cousin Sam were on the radio show sharing his story sharing the fact that he had these documents and he wanted to find the descendants. After he spoke, the genealogist called in. Some said, I think you're doing the right thing. Others started looking for Black Reinhardt's almost immediately. Uh, but that was part one. He was out there. I said, you need to continue to share. So we made a YouTube video. And with that YouTube video, they were given contact information. They knew how to contact me. They knew how to contact Kami. 
And then the third, he went even more public because he was a presenter at one of the largest genealogy conferences. It was online, Roots Tech. And so those three opportunities he had to get that information out there. Now, understand, we have a large number of white individuals that have records, just like Kami, that are not sharing these documents. So we don't even know. But you also have another side to this, and you have the seekers. You have people like me who will be looking for my ancestors. But because I don't even know who the potential enslaver could be, I may run into problems. And so this is what he did. He shared that information. In the meantime, we had a document. It wasn't just Jack and Cato. It was several people. And with those individuals, we had to make a decision. Do we start looking for them, let's say, going forward to 1870? Or do we? wait to see if any descendants would reach out to us. And so what you saw was the first descendants to reach out, to actually call me, and we talked. And Jamila Smith is the person. She was the one that said the little girl, uh, she didn't do what she did with Kami to other people in the family. But she was our first contact. But there was more. And I, and I guess it's, um, lots of people are skeptical. Yes. It's impossible. I, I don't think you're going to do this. I don't think you're going to find anybody. And, and, and some of those, so um, Michael was also skeptical about my yes, intentions. Yes, right. Another descendant reached out to me and identified himself. I'm a Reinhardt. My family's from South Carolina. Uh, is this man legitimate? I mean, is it really going to happen? Can you imagine somebody? You're thinking, like, what is he all about? He's not even from here. Uh, and I said, yes, he is. It's, do you trust him? Yes, I do. Uh, OK, then he then introduced us to other family members. We had a, a, a Zoom call. And he introduced us to other family members. And this is where the real work starts. Because you can't start at the end, meaning finding the enslaved person. You have to start at the beginning, meaning what is the contemporary family, and working yourself back. And this is what had to happen. I had to find out, what do you know about your family? What can you tell me about your family? And while the family members are sharing information with Kami, I'm doing research. I'm doing research the entire time. I'm reconstructing the family tree. I'm listening to what the family members are, do, are talking about. And so this is kind of a process that's very strategic. If you ever come to the United States and you're in any of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society conferences, you will hear us talking about our research process. We must have evidence. We can't just go by I think and I feel. We must be able to connect the dots all the way until we get to the right person. And this is kind of the process that took place to get to where Kami was in this video. Well, I, I, I just wanted to ask you if we can just slightly move into some of the, uh, the research that you, you've been doing. Obviously, with, with some of these historical records, they can be very fragmented. Some of them are in the public domain. Some of them are held by the descendants of the owners, slave owners. How does, if, if, you know, how do you, how did you, you know, how does one navigate that? I, I guess there's a question around, you know, this um, white monopoly yeah. on knowledge and access to archives um, and how the, d the descendants of the enslaved kind of navigate that because, you know, they might not even know these things exist. 
Right, they may not know these things exist. And for this particular community, the Old Edgefield District, as I mentioned, records did not burn. And there was one African-American researcher that was part of the genealogy, the Historical Society in Edgeville, that went through all of the records in the archives. And she compiled this 400 plus book, page book, with thousands of transactions, thousands, folks, which meant that we did have an opportunity, if you were aware that these records even existed, to at least read the papers and to find out what was happening in the slave-owning community. But it still wouldn't work if you could not get your ancestors with your own genealogy, at least back to the 1870 census. And the reason I'm saying the 1870 census is because prior to that, if we were documented anywhere, it was on a slave schedule with a name and an age, and you probably would not have found your ancestor listed unless they were free. Those that were enslaved, you would not find them. But there were other things that happened post-emancipation, for example, a federal uh, document in the Bureau, uh, Bureau of, uh, not Bureau of Land Freedom. Management, Freedom. but the Freedmen Bureau, and we would find individuals in labor contracts, sometimes with the former enslaver, but they'd sign a labor contract. That might be a bank record that a black person would have where they would list mother, father, sister, brother. Anyway, they would have a listing. But in 1870, you would see them first name, last name, and age, which means if I saw an 80-year-old in 1870, but that 80-year-old is not listed first name, last name, 1860, what have you, that person was probably enslaved. And so this is what we're going through this process. But you have to start at the beginning of your contemporary and work it all the way, understanding as you went back in time, you were doubling your ancestors. You know, four grandparents. Now you have to find the four grandparents' parents and great-grandparents. And you're really doing a lot of research. But there's also other information that individuals would have that they probably didn't pay as much attention to. Their obituaries, their marriage records, their birth certificates, uh, their voter registration. I mean, all of these documents are there if you know how yeah, to find so them. On yeah, if you if you know how to find them, then that's additional information that you have at your disposal to find your enslaved ancestor. Can I, can I ask you, Bernice, um, something? Sure. That, um, so you, you wear several hats. You wear a, a hat as professional Genealogy. genealogist, mm -hmm. but you, you have also engaged very deeply yourself with the process of finding out about your own history. Yes. And I, I just want to, I, I'm always curious what the motivations were of the people that agreed to meet me. What, what is it that is, driving, what, what is it that you think drives African Americans and by extension black British people whose histories came through the Caribbean, in other words they're enslaved, what, what is it, what is in it for someone like Jamila to meet someone like me and go through what is inevitably going to be a difficult process? What are they, what is she looking for? She's looking to be made whole. You know we talk about say their names She's looking for the opportunity to say her ancestor's name and to have that name uh, a part of who she is as a person. This is, kind of, this is where I started. I wanted to say their names and I wanted to find my own enslaved ancestors and then discovered there they were in the 1870 census. What made it different for me was that the descendant of the enslaver, because the descendant had records, she recognized every name on my ancestor's list. His wife, all of the children, 
and the children were named the same names of the others that were enslaved with them. So can you imagine looking at a record and seeing all of these same names, but your family owned them, but they were my ancestors. And so the motivation for me, it was very, very strong. I, 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 had, to, I had to find him. I, I just had to. I, couldn't, I, I just couldn't go to sleep and wake up the next morning not knowing where everybody came from and where they were until I found them. And the descendant, the descendant identified herself and provided me with the record. Can you imagine if everybody would do that? Wouldn't we, it would be jubilee. <laughs> I mean, we would jump up and down and be very excited if every white descendant of a slave owner would then provide that information. And it's not to say that we don't have some groups doing this. We have a group called Beyond Kin. And that group consists of individuals that have found documents and have made those documents available. But you still have a large number of people that just can't find their enslaved ancestors. It is extremely, extremely hard. Um, I just want to speak for two minutes, because I I'm aware that we have, um, or I, I believe that we have probably a lot of people from the Caribbean and the, the West Indies here. And I just want to translate the kind of work that Bernice has been doing into, you know, how someone over, you know, uh, here would do it. So, you know, my father came from Jamaica. Anyone who's looking to do the kind of research that Keme has done to trace their ancestry back to identify an enslaved ancestor, you know, the, the kind of records that we have here is you probably start off doing your oral history. So I spoke to my dad, um, I spoke to my granddad, and I found out about my great grandfather. Um, and it was, yeah, my dad, my granddad and my great grandfather, they're, they're born in Jamaica. So once I know their age and where they were born, then it's a case of going to the civil records in Jamaica. And the civil records, um, some of them are held at the, the uh, Spanish town archives. And these run from 1880 up until 1999. And what you're really looking for is similar to records to, to what Bernice said. You're looking for marriage, death certificates, burials, and baptisms. And once you're at, you look at the parish level, if you're able to, you know, identify what parish your, um, your, your ancestors or your grandparents came from. But then once you pick up maybe the birth certificate or marriage certificate, often it lists the father and the mother of the individual that you're researching and it lists their occupation. And you can use that as a stepping stone to continue going back. And after you've used the civil records, you move back in time because uh, they end in 1880 or they start in 1880. You have to start using the parish records and the parish records run from 1800 up until about 1870. So you can, you can trace back and again, the parish records, they've got the births, the deaths, the marriages, and you can trace your, your ancestry back um, using those to the official census of slave registers that the British government compiled for each parish, uh, for each country in the Caribbean, each colony and each parish. And the, the slave registers run from round about 1812 up until 1834. And if you're lucky enough, because some of these records, as you can imagine, they're decrepit, they're fallen, mm -hmm. fallen apart, country's been hit by a hurricane, um, so they don't exist. But if you're lucky enough, you'll be able to use that baptism Reg, uh, uh, record to trace back to the, uh, the slave registers and hopefully pick out and identify one of your enslaved ancestors. So, I mean, this is... But I guess the, the, the linked theme here yes. is that um, uh, white family history is relatively straightforward, white family I, genealogy. Mm -hmm. You look at the census, that's your first stop, and actually a lot of information is going to be there. But black family histories, because... We, you know, in, this, in American context, right. we weren't even enumerated in our own names mm -hmm. um, before 1870. The documents are everywhere. They're hidden. Names change. People get literally sold yes. down the river. Right. That is where the, the, the phrase comes from. 
So how do you trace your family history when it is subterfuges everywhere? Mm -hmm. uh, I've made it a bit e sound a bit easier than than, <laughs> it, than, it, than it actually is. It, no, absolutely, it's, it is right. very very difficult for us. Um, <laughs> descendants yeah. of the enslaved. I want to also mention mm -hmm. that while we will look at a surname and say, oh, that surname is for the, from the slave owner. Mm -hmm. No, not necessarily. You may find your ancestor has a totally different surname than the person, the last slave owner. So you have to think that way too. You have to think totally what they say, think out of the box look at different things. Sometimes you have to do a first name search rather than a last name search because of what the situation is in, in America. People are not taking, not everyone is taking on the, the name of the slave owner. No, no, absolutely. You, especially, I mean, I'm thinking in the West Indian context in Jamaica, the plantations out there are huge, two, three, four thousand acres. And often you have a a white managerial labor force um, who are paid, they're not enslaved, and um, bookkeepers and, and um, accountants, and sometimes the enslaved will take their surname from that individual. So just because your surname is Beckford or Dawkins or you know Price doesn't mean that, that the, the Prices or the Beckfords owned your ancestor, they might have taken the surname or um, from that slave owner, but actually, their biological line is from one of the white managers or yeah. overseers, which makes it incredibly difficult mm. to identify, you know, um, to identify your uh, your enslaved ancestors. But I mean, um, I guess what I wanted to ask you, there's been a lot of emphasis at the moment on the, um, you know, on the white side. And we always hear about the ownership of um, enslaved African people by white people. Mm. Kami, you are descended from... Uh, uh, you, well, your father is, uh, and you, you b born in Zambia. Oh yeah, to make matters really, really complicated, I was born in. I, my dad is Nigerian, but I was born in Zambia. Right, and I, I, do, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about one of the most painful parts of yeah. slavery, particular for, for all of us who have been displaced, which in the diaspora, who are descended from enslaved African people, which is, you, uh, it was your ancestors that sold some, uh, you know, captured and sold enslaved African people to white traders on the coast who then trafficked them, transported them into slavery in the Americas. How do you understand that? How do you deal with that? And what does that mean? Mm. It's, really, it's really hard. Um, so w one of the... One of the, I mean, the main motivation for, when my journalistic brain kicks in, I knew that this journey had to fundamentally be about fact finding, not about judgment. It needed to be about seeking as much clarity as I possibly could about what had happened, because I don't think we can come to any reasonable assessment of how we move forward unless we know how we got here. And so these were the factors I knew them. When I discovered the will that my uncle had sent, I, my parents were just the, the, the most supportive I could possibly imagine. This is going to be difficult history, but you must, if this is your calling, then you must go there. And they have been un unbelievably helpful in helping me, backing me to go through this process. My dad said, right, if you are going to look into the American side, which you should, then there are some stories that, are, that I have heard about our clan, our people, and I don't really know what to make of them because I've never been able to make sense of them. I've never researched it myself. We must understand that bit too. Slavery was systemic. Outputs require inputs. Now, bearing in mind that I, I know that there is a real risk that this, or the Africans were at it too, will get weaponized. Um, I fully believe that 
reparations and reparatory justice is massively important. So everything I do needs to be quite carefully presented so that it can't be used for what I consider to be regressive forces that don't, that, that don't want to deal with the outcome of racism. But nonetheless, there is a uncomfortable truth that for Africans to be trafficked across the Middle Passage, there must have been somebody involved in the abduction and the kidnap in the first place. So what was that mechanism? How did that happen? So the story that Dad had heard was that our clan, we're, we're, we're Igbos, which is the kind of major tribal group in southeastern Nigeria. A kind of sub-clan of the Igbo is the Arrow, the Arrow people. We, we are Arrow. We came out of Congo in the 1700s to Cameroon, to southeastern Nigeria. It was a trading kingdom, very, very powerful, um, the, uh, that controlled a, a huge amount of that part of Nigeria back in the day. One of the things that the Arrow people traded was human beings. Again, we have to distinguish between the internal domestic market for uh, slaves and in, 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 in enslaved people in that time, which was kind of more akin to a, it, this is not to justify it in any way, I'm just trying to clarify its historical fact. There was a perhaps Roman model, broadly speaking, of enslavement in that part of Nigeria where you, you weren't a permanent underclass. To be an enslaved person was not that your children and your children's children and their increase in the way that it's described. In, with, with, there was a categorical difference between what people understood to be enslavement in, in West Africa and what the slave societies of South Carolina and the Caribbean were intentionally designed to extract labor and... and Hereditary slavery. That's it. So we had heard that there, there was a story that the Arrow people had been selling individuals. There was also another story that we didn't know what to make of, of a potential family connection to a shrine in southeastern Nigeria where secret abductions took place. And again, we didn't know whether that was true or not. And bearing judgment aside, we, Dad and I went to Nigeria to try and understand as much as we could about all these stories. And we came away knowing that, yes, the Arrow were buying and selling, or middlemen, essentially. Um, but our family, we would never, there, were, there was no concrete evidence to suggest that our family was directly directly involved, but nonetheless we were part of a, by definition, we were part of a system that trafficked human beings to the coast, that then were trafficked to the Americas. So that's the fact bit. And um, I don't think it's anything, you know, I'm, it's not something I'll ever be able to, as a human being, as a, as a diasporic African, I, I can't forget that. I think that's one of the, the most challenging and difficult parts for people like Bernice and myself who are descended from enslaved African people, which, as you said, you know, uh, you know, to come to terms and really grapple with the fact that there are people who look like us, who may be from a different tribe, um, enslaved our ancestors or captured them and then sold them to white traders on the coast, you know, and I can imagine um, the, the people, is it J um, Jamelia? Jamila. Jamila, you know, I might have been one of those people um, years ago that would have said to you, do you know what came here? I don't, I don't know if I can do this with you because that's very, very, it's very painful, you know? And, and, and I would, throughout this journey, I would not have blamed anyone for saying, I'm not interested, because it's too difficult, it's too painful. It, it is, I mean, um, I'm, just, I'm just thinking about time, because we're, um, we're at quarter past six. Uh, we're okay? Um, I, I wanted to, to ask you a bit about the kind of like, and this is, I guess, for both of you, you know, the, the emotional dimension of the work, you know. What do you and Benice both think about the importance of knowing 
one's past? What is the significance of this? Because this is a question that always comes up. So what? I mean, it's, it makes a difference mm -hmm. to be able to say, I know where I came from. It makes a difference to, to honor the ancestors, mm -hmm. to let them know, I'm looking for you. I found you. I'm honoring you. I'm calling your name. And it's not that I want to deny that enslavement happened because it did. It's something that I want to be able to document and have to share with my children, my grandchildren, and more importantly, I want people to understand that this is something, this peculiar institution should never happen again. And if everyone understands this, then perhaps we will never have this happen again. It was brutal. It was not a good place for any human being to be a part of, but it's important as an African American to be able to say that I found my ancestors. And if, if I could go even one step further, going to Africa and really finding out where my ancestors were from is even more important. But I have to start somewhere and starting that somewhere is at least identifying who they are, who enslaved them, documenting that, and then sharing that with the family and with others. Telling my story is important. Telling their story is important. Um, you know, the, but my, my, my discovery is being able to be part of that process became incredibly important for me. But based on the, you know, the discussion we've had about documents and the process of research, mm -hmm. that thing is hard, man. <laughs> it <And> is. <laughs> it is. There are no guarantees Speak. of success. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I wonder, actually, if maybe we could, Speak. this would be a good opportunity to play that other short clip. Sure. Um, um, but just to put it, put that in context, what, what we're about to see is um, a, a small conversation that I ended up having with Jamila, who you saw earlier, in the archives, um, which is a place that I had got to know quite well. And because of the tutelage that Bernice had offered me, she had really tooled me up in my, um, you know, I mean, I am but a little <laughs> micron when it comes to the expertise that but I had begun to, I was more familiar with the documents, I could read them. Mm -hmm. And I knew that this was something I could, if Jamila wanted to go on that process with me, I could help her and her family mm -hmm. try and found, find out more stuff. And that was very meaningful to me, that I was able to do that for, with them. Again, this is, I'm not trying not to be patrician or like, you know, like this was about them and us coming together and going through the process. So there's a, a short clip of us Re reading documents and learning stuff from them, it doesn't always happen like this. And actually, more often than not, it's two steps forward, five steps Good backwards, back. 17 to the side, right. and you turn around and think, what the hell have I just learned? I'm even more confused. Mm -hmm. It's really, really, really hard. Um, but the process of connecting and black people together saying, you know what, this history is difficult, but let's see where it goes. It, it was really powerful for me. Is that right to watch that next clip? Just a short clip, thank you. When I first saw those documents, I said to myself, this is about an unpaid debt. Mm. My family did that. So you feel in some type of way that you're responsible for this? Not you, but your family. Yeah, we did it, right? So how do we fix this? I, I see what you're saying came around, okay. Yeah. It I would be that. wonderful if it could be fixed. <laughs> but That's I, the whole thing, I don't okay. think it can be. And I believe truly that if we had not been separated, uh, sold off, 
we would have been able to retain wealth. Knowing who you're a part of, that's as rich as you can get. Knowing, just knowing who you're a part of. Even if we can't get all the way back to the continent of Africa, just the time that we've been here. Who knew that somebody from the UK would be able to tell me more about my family here stateside <laughs> that I have been able to find out on my own. Let's get busy. <laughs> Wow. Um, I, I, I mean, that's a, a very powerful clip. I'm, I'm waiting for this to, to, to come out. I mean, um, why is it important for them, you know, to tell this story? What is it that, um, mm. that they, have, have they spoken to you about, you know, because, of course, they've said, listen, let's engage. I want, I'm, I'm interested in this journey, Take it, coming on this journey with you. What is it for, for them? I mean, I, I, I feel manifestly unqualified to answer that. Um, there, is, there is a small story I want to tell, but I think Bernice is probably better, better placed to say why it's important. Be again, because you've walked that path and I haven't. Yes. I've come at this from a, knowing who right. my ancestors are already. So. And, and one of the things, not only with this family, but with many families, they do have a little piece of something, oral history but they wanna make it all make sense. And so this family also had a story and then it stopped. There was something totally missing and they needed to pull it together. And remember, we had the seekers. These people, this family, they were looking because Kami went public and they reached out. They were already looking. They That's were the looking point, right? and this is what you'll find there are people looking, and we just need to have the other side come, come forward and share the information. It was very important to this family. The whole family came, the aunts came, the mother came. I mean, it wasn't one person. Uh, and we have another story of another family. You want to yeah. say? Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so... Um, we, we ended up working with two, with two main families, and they, in a sense, they kind of tell both ends of the, the spectrum of uh, black family research. I mean, like, this is a massive generalization. Jamila, uh, Jamila's family, where actually we ended up, there were, many, there were as many questions as answers. And, I, and it was the it was almost that the process was the important bit. There was another family that, that we haven't shown. And they live very close to my white ancestors, same surname, but there were still questions about where their surname came from. And we went through a process and together found the missing link that they had been looking for. However, um, and, and that's kind of unusual. Right. It's unusual to have absolute clarity um, for, a, for a lot of black families. It just doesn't, you know, it ends in just permanent more questions. However, uh, this, this family had been looking and their, their main historian was a woman about my age and she told me that she had tried and tried and tried to find answers. And as a younger woman, she had gone to archives. She'd done the work that Bernice had taught me to do. And the thing that stopped her, the thing that meant she could not do it anymore, was the trauma of reading these documents. Because each time she had to read about another um, enslaved ancestor, she, uh, she, she couldn't do it anymore. And so she quit. She quit. Right, and this is a this is a, uh, a a district in South Carolina where she said, and I use her words, they would cut the feet off slaves who had tried to escape as a punishment 
and a warning to others. That's how brutal this, this community had been. And it wasn't until ben, uh, Benice and I began to work with this family, and for, for us, it was slightly easier because it, it, we were one step removed from seeing those documents. It wasn't, these were not my family members. But to have someone take them through this history very, very carefully, very carefully, with as much respect as we possibly could, enabled them to gain that knowledge. And, and again, I really stress this, I, I really hope this doesn't sound patronizing or white savior or any, it was, look, we can help each other. I can do this bit for you. I can take that, some of that emotional weight off and I can sift and then we can come together and we can talk about it and I'll, we'll hold hands as we read this really difficult stuff. But at the end of it, we will find an ancestor that you want to find. I mean, I, I just want to kind of like build upon what you've said. Um, I think for me, in doing the research that, that I've done about my ancestors that are enslaved, why it's important is because there was millions of us that were trafficked into the Americas and we produced the raw materials, the, the, the rice, the mahogany wood, the sugar, the tobacco, these things, the indigo, they finance, uh, sorry, they f um, fuel Britain's industrial revolution. And when we go to school, we ain't told about where these come from, where the, the shipbuilding industry, the metallurgy industry, there's um, the, the, the gun trade that we have here. It's, we're not told about how our ancestors' labor helped fuel uh, and the profits might finance the Industrial Revolution. And there's no way, so I'm getting a bit passionate, but there's no way in hell that I'm going to have this country, the national curriculum, right, my ancestors who were dead, thrown into the ground, dirt covered over, tell its history, erasing them, marginalizing them. That's not happening on my watch. And so for me, it's very important that we understand it's a joint effort in terms of the, the Britain's development. There's the exploitation of the working classes, which is, uh, you know, this uh, wage labor, very, very, very different to enslaved chattel labor. Um, but we're part of that story and that's part of Britain's heritage and it's part of telling the, the broader history so our children with their black self can feel proud <laughs> that their ancestors built this country and can't no one say, go back home. This don't belong to you because we've just got just as much a stake here mm -hmm. as any of the other white brothers and sisters whose um, parents were exploited or did the exploiting, um, you know, so that's just super important to me. And when I go back to Jamaica, I always go to the plantations where my ancestors were enslaved and I pour that libation. I hold the, I hold the, um, the you know, soil. the soil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I take it all in. It's mm -hmm. very powerful, mm -hmm. very moving. And it gives me that, you know, that self-confidence, you know, so like, <laughs> sorry, I just had to go off on one, right? But <laughs> Is there, we're, we're approaching the end of the time. Is there, is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to say before I open it up to the floor and we get an onslaught of questions and, you know? Let's hear the questions. Yeah? Uh, man, I, the I, I, literally, I could talk for hours, so I think Yeah, we, we can talk. Amy <laughs> and Bernice, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Wow. This is the great Professor Nicola Rollock I introduced. Do you know, this is the last time I invite you out with me. <laughs> Can we, that was deeply powerful. And Bernice, thank you also for the guidance and support you've offered Kemi. I've done a little dabbling myself in terms of my own background, my surname being Rollock. It's a Scottish surname, which I take great pleasure in telling 
uh, trolls on social media when they try to uh, interpret it in other ways. I was very moved by your account this evening, but you still kept us in some degree of suspense. I am very intrigued by the photo that's up behind you, and I wonder if you could share a few words about it for us. Thank you. Sure. Um, and uh, Well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it. Um, early on in my uh, journey, uh, I and, my, and uh, another cousin uh, f found a, when I say found, visited a informal family cemetery. Uh, in, the, in the southern states, there are lots of kind of unofficial cemeteries for various reasons. We, we visited it and immediately thought that there, the pattern of um, stones unmarked might be the unmarked graves of enslaved people because there were very, very prominent headstones that you'd find in a conventional cemetery and then what appeared to be um, on first glance haphazard stones, but they, but they clearly weren't. Um, we discovered some time later that they almost certainly were the marker, markers that had been laid down for, previous, for formerly enslaved people, that they had been buried in the same cemetery as our white ancestors, but, with, but without the same care. And we didn't really know what to, to make of that. On the very last trip that I made, uh, I was invited to come back to that informal cemetery by a, a, a white cousin that I had just met, so part of the kind of new white family that I had uh, discovered during the course of my investigations. And he, um, he knew a lot about the cemetery because his dad used to be the, the caretaker. And he confirmed that he was. He confirmed that they were. Um, they were. It was a slave cemetery. And um, I didn't really know what to do with that because there's very little information. So we ended up. Um, I, I told the the, descend, the black descendants that I was going to be going to the cemetery to find out more with this white cousin, and it, you know, it wasn't for me to gatekeep. It would be a difficult visit, but. You know, if I'm going, then, you know, if you don't want to come, that's totally cool. I get it. It's difficult. But if you want to come, then come. So over the course of a few days while we were there, me, the, the, the white cemetery expert who was, it must be said, a total liberal in a kind of, you know, Trumpian sea. Um, so he was very supportive of what I was doing. He's like, yeah, come, come. I want to tell you all this stuff. And, you know, there's like Confederate bloody memorabilia in the cemetery and the rest of it. But he, he's very, very, he wanted this history to be shared. So me, the black descendants, and to my surprise, the elderly white Southern relatives who I had also met agreed to come to the cemetery to hear about the history, to hear what, what the caretaker dude knew about it. And we also realized that we couldn't just go and hear that we needed to do some form of commemoration. And we, we created a, a ceremony between us where we spoke then. Spoke, but by this stage, I had done enough research to have a pretty good list of the, a pretty definite list, as far as I was aware, of all of the people that our white ancestors had enslaved during that period. So in other words, that cemetery could be their resting place. Or if they hadn't been buried there, they may well have buried their loved ones there or had trod those ground or dug the graves for the white people. So we decided that we needed to do some kind of, we needed to honor them in some way. So together we created a, a, um, a, a, a commemoration and that's, that's just a, a still of that moment. And what's the, the gentleman? Is it a, 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 a sat down? Are they holding a book? Or? This, is, this is my cousin, Joe Reinhardt. 
This is his wife, Sylvia. They, they live in Edgefield. This is Navaya, who is the little girl who you met in the first clip. Thank you so much for the, for, for the talk and the discussion. It's beautiful, it's powerful, um, and, and very moving. Um, my question is partly a political one. Um, in reading your subtitle, Genealogy, Storytelling, and Ethics in the Wake of Slavery, um, it feels like we're in a, in a, in a post-slavery political context, which is very complex. So here in the UK, we have denials about the economic impact of slavery, um, and not just a forgetting of those stories, but a revisionist history that claims um, that the economic benefits of slavery to the UK were limited, if not minimal, and that the emphasis gets placed on ending slavery and the heroic role of Britain within that. But what happens when those arguments are made by black figures? What happens, how do we think through the politics of an intervention when some of the leading advocates of this reactionary right-wing right uh, narrative are leading black politicians, leading, leading black figures? Um, so how do we make sense of that? And in the US, when we have figures like Elon Musk um, arguing that the best way to deal with racism is to stop talking about racism. <laughs> and further, as he said in a recent interview, um, well, wasn't everybody enslaved at some point? So what's the special status that we should give to African Americans? Um, how do we make sense of you know, a, a, a white person born in South Africa making those types of arguments, which is effectively to say, why don't you blacks stop talking about slavery and racism because it's in the past? So this is the kind of post-slavery political moment that we're in. And I'm wondering if you could speak to what work, political work, that you hope your, your work does, the documentary does, in, in addition to the brilliant moving narratives, because we are in a moment of backlash right now. And I think we need to understand the reemergence of white supremacy in a different guise. Uh, and, and I think your work speaks powerfully to those issues. So just, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on the current political moment that, that your work is coming into. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ben Carrington. Is, is there another one? To... There are other questions. Oh. Um, I'm Addy. I'm Kami's daughter. Um, but that doesn't matter. Um, and I, this is a question for both Bernie's and Kami. Um, and so during your journey of the research of the filming and obviously the, the, the story that is more to come, what has been the most difficult part of the process for you? Yeah, that's what I'd like to know. Thank and there's you. one more question back here. Hey, Kami. Hey, Nish. Um, I just wanted to say I was really moved when Bernice was talking about um, honoring the ancestors by saying their name and going to these various areas and your, your libation, Kami. Um, that really moved me to connect out loud with the saying of the names and uh, in whatever form you did that in. Um, my question is that, did you go back even further than those names on the list? Uh, did, what, did you feel inclined to look, look up, you know, what, where did they arrive to? What ship do they come on? Is that anything you're going to be pursuing in the future? Thanks, Nish. Um, do, do, maybe, do, do you want to just kind of answer on how tricky it is to get even further back first, and then I'll answer Ben and Addy. Right. It, once again, it is extremely difficult to get further back. I mean, if I could find where my ancestors came from in the ship, I would be doing a happy dance all across this floor. It is extremely difficult. And so with Kami's records, we didn't even see what, we didn't see their origin. We just saw their names. And in some cases, you don't know where they bought them from. You just see the document with them listed. Now I'm looking at records for my own ancestors and I'm seeing people that sold them to the next slave owner. But it still takes a lot of work just to find that. And it's not easy. 
it, it's not easy. And I, I, I want to keep saying it because I don't want us to, to stand here or sit here and have you all walk out saying, oh, that was so easy for them to do. It wasn't. It wasn't. And, and on that note, I want to just put a massive shout out to my mum, who spent hundreds of hours and the, that's scouring, right. um, scouring documents all over the internet um, and helping Benice and me. Yeah. So. Yes. And, and she, wa she was really working hard to bring them forward. So can you imagine, we're trying to go forward with people listed in 1829, but we still had to get to 1870, and they could have changed names four or five different times. And so, I, I mean, I just commend you for, for the work that you did, because I looked at it, but I also understood how difficult it was. And so I look at it in a different way, I look at, let's start with the contemporary and work it back rather than to start in 1829 and work it forward because they would have changed so many different hands and different names. So it's, it's a process. It felt for me, I don't know what the word is, a teeny, 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 tiny way of saying to those that my family enslaved, I'm sorry. Yeah. I want to help. Mm -hmm. So it was a privilege and a pleasure to do it. Thanks, Mum. <laughs> um, Prof Carrington. Uh, so to be clear, you're talking about Kemi Badenoch? <laughs> <laughs> Do you really need me to answer? <laughs> I will. I think what we're talking about there is um, the confusion between the politics of diversity and representation. And there is an elite of right-wing politicians of color who have got to that position because they have actively denied the race injustice. Um, and part of our job is about powerful storytelling to correct that. And if there is one thing that can come out of the work that Benice has helped me do. It is to try and activate some of that storytelling. So to um, acknowledge that this is difficult. It is difficult emotionally, and it is difficult technically and practically, but there are ways to do it. And I knew that when I saw that will, for me personally, I, I couldn't look away, and I had to go on that journey myself. But what I've learned is there, there are tools that we have at our disposal and we can deploy them. And if we deploy those tools by having these conversations, then maybe we can elevate this, this conversation in political spaces so that this history is taken seriously. So that it's, it's, a, it's a mix of the political and the practical and the personal. For me, everybody will do that differently. Right. And banning books and not talking about it it's not gonna make it go away. I mean. Um, no, yeah, you wanna say something? I just wanna build on what uh, Kami has said, which is, okay, Kami, let's look at the facts. Let's look at the, for example, the Legacies of British Slave Ownership Project, which has traced the cultural, the political, the economic, the historical legacies of the transatlantic slave economy and the ownership of enslaved African people. And let's find out where the profits, where the revenues were invested. Where was the compensation money invested? Um, let's, uh, sorry, I'm losing my, my, my train of thought. Yeah, you're absolutely, but that, those histories are intentionally hidden in this country because we pretend that we abolished slavery when we invented it. And, Absolutely. And, and, and the thing is, you know, there's this, there's this focus on the last 40 years of slavery from 1783 to 1883, um, which is the, you know, the abolition. Well, what about the other two or 300 years that came before that when you're exploiting enslaved African people and there are millions, hundreds of millions of tons of raw materials flowing into the country, enriching it 
um, Fuelling's an industrial revolution. There's there's universities now. There's the um, uh, national institutions which are um, it, um, researching their links to the um, and their connections, the enrichment from and connection to the transatlantic slave economy. Instead of talking about abolition, why don't we also talk about the eighty percent? of cotton and tobacco that continued to flow into this country after 1833 when slavery was abolished. Um, let's it grown by? Right, it comes from the United States of America as well. The predominant modality of labor is, ensla is from enslaved African people and Britain's reliance on that only increases um, up until the Civil War, the end of the Civil War in 1865. Uh, and of course, there's the um, slavery is not uh, chattel slavery isn't totally abolished until 18, I think it's 1888 when it, um, in, in Brazil. But there's, even after slavery is ended here, there's a massive, the, 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 the economy is locked into and it relies upon enslaved African produce um, to fuel its industrialization. And that creates hundreds of thousands of jobs here. And what you hear when in the period of abolition is, well, if we abolish slavery um, or the slave trade, it's going to economically cripple the country. It's massively reliant on this. So people like Badenoch tell us you need to come see Dr. Darkins. <laughs> yes. Amy, I'm not going to let you get away with not answering I'm your daughter. But I just, I'm just before, before that, just want to say one quick thing, which is... Um, uh, you know, as a, speaking as a British South Asian, we're actually not just talking about Kami Badenoch, right? So just to remind you, okay? Do you want to name names? I think we know who we're talking about. No, but diversity conservatism is much more pernicious, right? And it's something we need to take seriously, yeah. actually. Um, and for our next event. Anyway, sorry. Um, um, I... Uh, Adi, thank you very much for for, for asking that because you know you um, I think you probably know me almost better than anyone else in in, in the room, and I think you picked up on something very um, personal there. I always knew that um, confronting the confronting the really, really deeply historic ancestral stuff was going to be difficult. That trying to find meaningful and safe ways to talk about this stuff with the people that are, because they're your ancestors too, had, had enslaved, would be, would be really difficult. But that was still somewhat external. And actually, I think the hardest thing is going to be figuring out how I publicly tell the story of why this hurt me so much. And I've been pushing against that. And actually, this is today is the first time I've really ever publicly talked about uh, navigating how I have had to navigate racism and my experience of running away from the racists as a kid. Because this is, this is stuff that I, and I'm sure many people in this room, would prefer to bury. Because it, it's, in, it's in here, it's down there, it's down the back of my neck. And I will never shake it. And the, these are experiences that I don't want you or your friends to ever have to go through. And that's, that's why realizing that my people had been part of constructing that wrongness was so devastating for me. We, I'm gonna, I think we've got time for one more quick round of questions. Um, so I've got some hands up, I'm gonna come to you. Are you okay for one more round? Yes, okay. yes, yes. Thank you so much for this. My name is Renako Salina. Um, I'm an investigative journalist at the BBC World Service, and we produce report long-form investigative documentaries. By night, I'm also a hobbyist genealogist. I have been since 2018, since a massive family reunion on the tiny island of Karakou. Um, my question is kind of related to some of the similarities between these two spaces. 
one of the things that I found is there's tons of similarities with the way that we practice journalism and genealogy, but there's also lots of similarities in the problems or challenges, including something that I constantly hear as a younger person in like more legacy newsrooms, which is engaging younger audiences. Mm -hmm. I wondered if during the process of constructing this project, you kind of had to think about engaging younger audiences, what that looks like, especially in storytelling. I think that was one of the things I was really, really keen to hear on. And if I have time for a second quick one, it was about DNA tests and whether that was a process, that was part of your process, sorry, in this. Um, if it was, were you met with skepticism? How did you deal with that if, if you were? Yeah, but thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Suzanne francis Brown. I'm from Jamaica. Um, and I do have done a little bit of work in journalism and history and genealogy. So this is, this is, um, this is a great uh, combination of research, historical research and storytelling. So I really appreciate it and I thank you both. Uh, my, I have two, two questions or one question and one very, very quick comment. One relates to Nigeria and where you're going with that story. Um, you know, how you're going to further approach that trajectory. And the second, just very quickly in a sense, speaks to something Bernice was talking about in terms of the need to somehow dig up some of that material that is hidden in terms of some of those records. And for the Caribbean, it's something that I I've had done a little bit of work with the Center for the Legacies of British Slavery, and it's one of the things I think is so important. In Jamaica, we, uh, James has mentioned this, there were thousands of people who owned enslaved people on plantations, in urban settings, in rural settings. In many instances, one of the reasons that we cannot locate people is because the private records, the ledgers in which those persons were identified and recorded are not coming forward. Mm -hmm. There are very, very few of them out there. And from my perspective, many of them are here. Many of them are in the bottoms of chests, in lawyers' offices or in, on estates. And People can make them available. You know, I, I understand the complexities of it, but I really think it's important. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out, partly as a, as a um, an agreement with you in terms of the the work in the United States, but partly also just to to try and shine a little bit of light on something that I think is possible um, and is not happening. So. Those two things. One more. Okay. Hello. Sorry. It's just a very quick question. Uh, we've heard about the American side of the reaction to your research and the family, and you also <coughs> mentioned that the Nigerian side. What was the reaction there, and do you plan to explore that a bit more? Um, was you know how did they react? Is there denial? Is there ownership? And how does that fit in with the mm. broader story? While we're running the mic, I'll start. So, big up to my Niger cousins in the house. Yeah. <laughs> and seeing you. Um, so, um, I, and I'll try and run through these super quickly because I know we've not got much time. So, Marcia, Nigeria. When Dad and I decided to go back to try and investigate, find out what we could about the role of this shrine that was where abductions were said to take place, um, Dad... Um, uh, 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 arranged for us to go with a cousin. The cousin told his uncle, uh, and then first it was just like a few of us, then another cousin would be like, uh, you're going to the ancestral homeland and you haven't invited me, I'm coming too. And da 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 Within the space of about a week, we had a bus. <laughs> we had a bus of people with plenty, plenty jollof and chicken on the bus to keep us fed as we went there. Um, uh, so, um, uh, on a family level, a, a, a huge amount of interest and intrigue and confusion and desire to get to the truth. Um, when we actually got to Arachuku, our ancestral homeland, um, uh, people were, were, uh, were much more open 
about this history than I, I thought there might be a bit of reluctance to discuss it, but it happened, so people are talking about it. Um, there is also some jiggery-pokery going on with the public storytelling about whether, um, uh, uh, um, why those abductions happened. So there was some, so, so to very, very briefly, shrine, secret abductions, the shrine was a, basically a high court where people could be executed if they'd been really, really naughty. There, there, we read an editorial uh, in a newspaper when we were there that suggested that the fake sacrifices that took place, so instead of actually executing them, fake sacrifices would take place and the people would be smuggled out the back, that this actually was a good thing because to be smuggled and, uh, and condemned to, to uh, permanent slavery was better than to be killed. So make of that what you will. We haven't got time here to get to the bottom of that, but there is some Jedi mind trick post facto rationalization going on, which, you know, where? Yeah. So, Nigeria. Um, your question about White Archive, I, I, you're, I think you've got a great story on that, haven't you? Uh, yeah, the power just, of White Archive. Yeah, um, many, as uh, Suzanne, Dr. Suzanne Francis Brown has, has said many of the manuscripts um, that exist from the period of slavery, particularly of the more distinguished and wealthy slave owning families who came back to Britain, they own them, they're in their attics. Um, and the only way that you can get at them is uh, tracking them down if you're lucky enough as I was and befriending them nice them up so you can so nice them up so so you can go in and gain access to them and um so um the professor richard dawkins this some people will know him the uh, the biologist bre he um has loads of chests and this really old um creepy attic and i'm doing my research on the dawkins family found out that it's his ancestors that own mine i hail him up richard Listen, what's in the attic? He said, listen, there's, <laughs> he says, he said, listen, there's all these papers. Come over to the estate and you can look at them. He is quite open about it. So I go up there and it's like Aladdin's cave. There's all sorts of stuff that his enslaved ancestors are brought over. Um, and of course, I take photos of all this and I've got a record. It helps me to trace, help trace my ancestors. But there are many people with the surname Dawkins or their ancestors will have been owned by Richard and they can't trace their ancestors back past 1817 if they're lucky. Richard's records go back into the, I think that like the 1750s, the 1770s. I had some lady come to me, she said, listen, my ancestors were enslaved on Folly Pen and Sandy Gully. Can you, can, I've, I've been able to trace them to the 1820s, but I don't know anything else about them. Can you tell me? And I said, listen, let me check Palmyra card, <laughs> right? So, so I, went, I went back into my records from 1800s. These are the private records. Then I went back to 1779 and I said, here's your seven times great grandmother. Um, her name is Brazil. She's working um, in the, as a domestic and she's 47 years old and she's listed as in good health. And she also has two daughters that are also working in the house. But the only way for that woman to get that information was because I'd kind of like knocked on Richard's door. And if Richard had closed those archives down, she wouldn't know anything. I wouldn't know anything. So I think that the, the thing is, and one of the things I've been doing is trying to encourage Richard and other slave owning families that have these manuscripts. Listen, you need to deposit them in the public domain because mm. this is our history it's all of our as history. well. And you need to share that with us. You can't have that kind of monopoly. Mm. Which is, I think, a very, <laughs> like your, because let's face it, the history of genealogy is a racist thing. And you have been dealing, so. Right, I mean, I'm a part of several genealogical groups. And one of the genealogical groups is the National Genealogical Society. And just last year, 
the National Genealogical Society apologized, apologized to an individual and his family because they denied membership, because there was a point in time, yes, where it was not perceived that African Americans were at the standard or even were interested in their genealogical history. One of the good things that we have going on and one of the things that must take place is education. We have the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. This group consists of individuals from all over the United States and they're doing African-American genealogy. You can learn workshops, uh, chapters that have meetings and they talk and they share. And so it sometimes goes beyond what's in a white descendant's records. Sometimes you have to look at records where we're also telling our own stories. For example, if that person was a, a Civil War soldier and they had a pension, what are they going to say? I was enslaved by. Well, you have to know to go and look to see if your ancestor was in the Civil War. I mean, you also have to look for other opportunities to find your ancestors. They could have been a runaway slave. You know, there was a lot of resistance to slavery. And the names of the individuals that ran away, it was put in the newspaper with great detail. Well, you have to know to go and study runaway slave ads. There are also slave narratives where people are telling their stories. We have to then say, look, go and study the slave narratives. And if you're going to look at a census, analyze the census record. Really look at it. What do you see? Where was that person from? What did they do? And who's living next to them and down the street and around the corner? It takes a lot of work, but it's possible. But you can't do it being passive. You have to be active in this process. So I will rattle through the, th the three questions that, um, what, is the, what are future plans with Nigeria? Um, one of the things that uh, the families that we've worked with have uh, mooted is the archetypal visiting Nigeria. Or vi uh, now, um, I, I think that's a lovely idea, but from, a, from the very kind of, from the perspective of what is healing, I have to figure out from a, from a filmic perspective, does it just, is that like a little bit kind of Alex Haley light? Is it really meaningful? Or is it just here are some slave castles? What would be the purpose of us going as a group to Nigeria? If it's about learning about Igbo culture, um, we are Igbo, Benice, through her DNA, which is the next point I'm gonna make, is 25% Igbo. These things start to become meaningful, but just going, I don't know. Is, that, is, it, is it real? And, I, and I'm curious. I don't have the answer. But, it, but what we do has to be authentic because what we've tried to do is create, is find people that want to go on this journey together for their own reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so I mentioned DNA. Lots of, lots of, DNA can be incredibly powerful. It can be very misleading. Um, and people are very rightly skeptical about who owns the data. Okay, so yeah, people are a bit like, well, which company? And, and just again, to put it out there, the whole, all, most of the DNA industry, ancestry and the rest of it, it's owned by the Mormon church. What are they doing with it? What are their motivations? So there are layers to this that are slightly more complicated than they might appear at first blush. Young people. Um, uh, I mean, this is all of our history, and I know that as a father, I didn't really start to get interested in this until I was an old man. You know, my hair wasn't even gray, it was gone. But I can also say that some of the most profound and useful challenge that I have experienced has come from my daughters, who have asked me some amazing questions as I've gone along this journey. So I, thank you. Um, I know for a fact that there will be many more questions that we all want to ask uh, Kami, Bernice and James. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw time on, on the official 
events now. As I said earlier, there is a, a drinks reception just outside here, so please do join us, um, grab a drink and ask more questions, have more conversation. Welcome to stay um, and talk more informally. And it just remains for me really just to, just to thank you all three of you for a really moving, wonderful um, and, and important conversation. Um, so please, everybody, please join me in thanking James, Cameron, <laughs> Dominic.